Hey everybody, this is Matt Shu from Upright Health, and today uh, I'm going to be talking with you about some recent research about hip impingement, also known as femoral acetabular impingement, that I think is really relevant for you to know, uh, whether you are somebody who's been told you have hip, in, hip impingement or you are a healthcare professional who is just concerned about um, how to talk about hip impingement and Maybe you're wondering if surgery is the thing that makes the most sense for your patients or um, clients. And today we're going to just be looking at the idea of whether hip impingement theory and diagnosis really makes sense. What I'd like to start with is whether or not this stuff is even a problem. So this crude, crude drawing here is the ball and uh, here's the socket. So dealing with the hip joint here. Now. Uh, just so anyone who's tuning in now doesn't already know, cam impingement is when the femoral head, this is your femur, crude, crude femur, the femoral head is supposedly misshapen, so you have uh, extra bone supposedly there, and that causes you to run into the, to the acetabulum, you run into the socket too soon. Uh, you can have pincer impingement in which the socket is overgrown and then you run into the you run into the femur head too soon when you start going through hip motions. Um, you could have a mixture of both, so then you could have cam and pincer impingement. And so the general idea with FAI is that if you have these, these problems with the bone shapes, or also known as the bony morphology, um, these bone shapes start creating too much friction in here and start chewing up the soft tissue that's in the joint. Now, that sounds bad, and it probably is bad to have the inside of your joint chewed up. Now, the idea we need to think about, though, is whether or not it, it is true that this stuff, like cam impingement and pincer impingement, we have to wonder whether or not this necessarily leads to the hip pain and the hip mobility problems you have to see that the bone shapes are actually related at a very high rate to people having movement problems and pain. The, the causative relationship has to be shown that if you've got this, you end up here. Okay? So, um, typically, there, there are a couple ways you could do the imaging to figure out what's going on with the bones. One of the easiest ways, and I believe is one of the cheapest ways, is to do x-rays. So there's a study done um, called the prevalence of the prevalence of cam type deformity of the hip joint. It was a survey of 4,151 people in the Copenhagen Osteoarthritis Study. So um, this was published in 2008. And what they did was basically look at people's uh, hip joints with x-rays and then see how, how many people have problems and then see how it correlates uh, with actual hip pain. And so in this study they said, um, key point was the overall prevalence of cam deformity was approximately 17% in men and 4% in women. The distribution of cam deformity was unaltered in subjects with normal joint space width or other features of hip joint degeneration, which basically means it really didn't matter if you if you seem to have hip joint degeneration or not, um, you may or may not have cam deformity, it didn't seem to matter. Um, we found no significant association with self-reported hip pain. It is a far from uncommon deformity in subjects with no apparent evidence of hip joint um, osteoarthritis. So that last sentence basically means you can have cam deformity and no evidence of arthritis. Okay. Uh, they also said, we found no significant association with self-reported hip pain. That means you could have this and not have pain. So that's a very clear example of this not being related to this. Okay. Um, now we also need to think, well, what about like hip range of motion? Is that an issue that this causes? So... Um, there was a study done in 2011 called the prevalence of radiological signs of femoral acetabular impingement in patients presenting with long-standing adductor-related groin pain. Uh, that was in the Brit British Journal of Sports Medicine. 
And key points, uh, radiological findings of hip impingement are often present. Okay, so you can have hip impingement. Findings of hip impingement are often present without the anterior hip impingement test being painful. So the anterior hip impingement test is basically a movement screen. Uh, you're basically kind of moving somebody's leg into a certain position and twisting. And if it provokes pain, that's supposed to mean that you have um, impingement happening as a result of this. So in this study that they did in 2011, they said you could find this, you could find impingement in the x-ray without the hip impingement test, that movement test, being positive. Okay? So then their conclude, one of their conclusions is the anterior hip impingement test may not be specific for femoral acetabular impingement. These, this and this are not actually related. They may coexist, but this doesn't seem to actually cause that. Okay? Now, I have had people say, well, x-rays are not necessarily the gold standard. Maybe um, you need to use, you have to use more exacting, more precise imaging to really figure out what's going on um, to identify uh, hip impingement, which, uh, fair enough, I will entertain that idea. So, in a study called CT findings of features resembling femoral acetabular impingement in a young population without symptoms. Okay, so this was a study done um, with 50 patients um, from ages 20 to 40, all of whom had no symptoms. Okay, zero symptoms. These are 50 very healthy people, no problems. And so what they found was that at least one abnormal parameter was present in 66% of joints and two or more abnorm abnormal parameters were present in 29% of joints. Uh, in seven patients, the findings were bilateral. So parameters of mixed morphologic characteristics, meaning cam and pincer, were found in 22% of joints. So you had 50 people who had zero symptoms and you had you had 66% of them with at least one thing that kind of made you go, mm, maybe they have impingement going on. Uh, you had 30% of the joints that had two or more abnormal things going on. But these are 50 people who have no problems. Looking at more evidence, uh, there was another study uh, that was published in 2011 in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. Um, that looked at the prevalence of CAM-type femoral acetabular deformity in asymptomatic adults, so people who have no problems at all. They had 215 men and they had 540 women, and what they found was that 14% of the men who had no symptoms of hip impingement were classified in the CT scans as pathological, meaning they would be told they had hip impingement even though they had no physical symptoms and didn't have any problems to report. They found that 5.5% of the 540 women were pathological based on the parameters set for CT scans of the, and in looking at the alpha angle. Okay? So what you're seeing again is you can have this stuff in CT scans and it will not mean anything. It doesn't mean you have a problem. So even if you did have a, if you don't have a problem, you can have this. If you do have a problem, you could have this. So does that mean that this is the problem? It, it doesn't seem like it is, right? If this is really the root of the problem, then you shouldn't be able to find this in a ton of asymptomatic individuals, right? Just because you, let's say you have an individual who has pain, if you find this, how can you say that this is causing the problem when you have so many people who have this, but don't have the problem. Finally, um, some people will say, well, MRIs are a better tool to investigate this. So um, in 2010, there was a study done using MRIs on people who had no symptoms again. So this was 200 people with zero symptoms, um, 111 women and 89 men. 14% had CAM impingement, uh, a quarter of the men had CAM impingement and 5% of the women had CAM impingement. These 200 volunteers all had zero symptoms. So again, you had the finding of this using MRIs, not having anything to do with symptoms. Okay? You basically can have this and no problems. You could have problems and have this, but 
there's no causative relationship. This doesn't seem to cause this at all. When you look at so many asymptomatic people, especially men, um, have this deformity without any symptoms. The whole idea that this is causing this really needs to be revisited. And in my opinion, in Shane's opinion, really we should be looking at helping the muscles do their jobs properly to help the joint articulate properly. Thanks everybody, and remember that pain sucks, life shouldn't.